Hi, welcome to our history of education course to what I like to think of as unit zero, our course introduction. It's not really full unit, it's a chance to get to know one another, get to know the online space and get to know a little bit of the kind of work that we're gonna be doing. Uh, I'm Dr. Gibson, you can call me Dr. Gibson, Professor Gibson, Professor Melissa, um, whatever you're most comfortable with, I am most comfortable with as well, particularly when working with graduate students. Many of us are peers here at the university. Um, so uh, any of those names, titles, terms of address, I'm comfortable with. Um, I am gonna switch over into the presentation for this Unit Zero each unit I will post a lecture that accompanies the readings and the content and the learning activities. Um, I know that online lectures are meant to be short, they're meant to be five to ten minutes max. I do my best but there's a lot of content for us to cover and um, I want to make sure that that I'm adding the instructional voice that I know many of us crave in these online asynchronous classes. So here we go. In this first short introductory mini unit, Unit Zero, uh, I want to do a little bit of thinking about why it's important for us to be studying the history of education, uh, even if we're not historians even if we are not going into foundations work, I don't mean foundation like a nonprofit, I mean um, foundational work at the university like in um, history, sociology, the disciplines that study education. So most of us are practitioners. Um, some of us have hopes of being scholars and researchers, but even then many of us are interested in applied research. And so why the history of education? To answer that question, I want to introduce this phrase, Genesis Amnesia. So this is a phrase that was used um, by the French sociologist uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who you may be familiar with if you've taken Dr. Bird's Sociology of Education class. And Genesis Amnesia uh, literally is the forgetting of how things began. And it is the idea that in forgetting history, in forgetting how we have come to be where we are, we come to accept the world as it is, as normal and as inevitable. And thus, Genesis Amnesia, the forgetting of history, the forgetting of how things began, is a tool for maintaining systems of oppression. It's a way that systems of oppression go unquestioned. Um, it's a way that social structures that do not benefit us are accepted as inevitable and just the way things are. And so a history of education course one is a way to push back against Genesis amnesia in education. It's important to remember that education, despite what any of our own personal feelings are or intentions, that education in the United States is and has been an oppressive system. Why do I say that? I, here I want to draw on the work of Ibram Kendi, who specifically talks about racism and anti-racism. But I think that this is a useful way of thinking about um, oppressive and anti-oppressive systems as well. So often when we think about racism, and by extension when we think about oppression or someone who is, acts as an oppressor, the common parlance has us thinking about an individual's intentions and belief systems and individual actions. But Kendi argues that racism, and thus a racist, so a racist is not so much someone who has specific belief systems, but it's someone who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or their inactions. It may also be that they're expressing a racist idea, but often someone acting as a racist is doing so tacitly by accepting racist systems and policies without question. So how do we define a racist policy and by extension a racist system? Kendi argues that a racist policy is any policy, whether written or unwritten, laws, procedures, et cetera, practices, best practices, right? that produces or sustains racial inequity 
in racial groups. Let me say that again, and it's here on the slide, obviously, but a racist policy, and policy is thought of broadly here, is any policy, any measure that produces inequitable results. So if we look at schooling today in the US, we all have heard this expression, the achievement gap. Many of us are also familiar with critiques of it, looking at instead the education debt or the opportunity gap. But regardless of what we call it, we see that there are inequitable outcomes between different racial groups, between different class groups, between different linguistic groups, between different ability groups that there are differential outcomes of schooling in the United States. If we take Kendi's idea about what racism is and what a racist policy is, and we extend that just a bit to think about it as oppression and an oppressive policy of which racism is part, we can see that education produces inequitable outcomes. Thus, it is a system that whether the individuals within it want it to be or not, acts oppressively. For many of us, that's a hard pill to swallow, right? Most of us are here um, because while we may be questioning education, while we may have concerns, while we may recognize it, I would doubt that any of us here um, would identify as someone who is supporting a racist policy or an oppressive school system. But by nature of being a part of it, we have to actively work against it. In order to do that, we have to understand how we've come to be where we are. We have to fight Genesis amnesia. So how do we do that? We need tools and we need the tools, I would argue, of historical thinking. Specifically, a tool that you're going to read about this week called historiography. So for those of you that studied history um, as undergraduates or in graduate programs, or that were lucky enough to have a great K-12 history teacher who introduced you to this idea explicitly or implicitly, historiography is a powerful tool within history, the discipline of history. James Lowen gives a really simple definition that works for our purposes here. Certainly, um, uh, a historical scholar can uh, uh, argue or clarify this definition, but for our purposes, we can understand historiography as the study of how history came to be, the study of how a piece of history came to be, the study of how a historical narrative came to be. Now that word narrative is really important because often when we say history, we use that word as a synonym for fact, a synonym for truth. When in fact, if we're talking about a fact from the past, we are talking about the historical record, right? History, what we study as history in schools and in the university is a narrative. And it's a narrative that's been constructed by people, sometimes in a historical moment or after it, it's a narrative that's been constructed to tell the story of a particular time in a particular place, particular identities, particular experiences, right? It's a narrative that has been constructed. That's critically important to our study this semester because what we're gonna be doing is questioning some of the narratives that have been constructed about schooling in the United States and asking how these narratives came to be and what other narratives are there. And so when we talk about narratives, there are a few ideas that are important here. So we can talk about, for example, a dominant narrative. Dominant narratives we can think of as those really common narratives that everyone knows, right? Um, what you might find in a traditional K-12 history textbook, um, but dominant narratives are more than just common. Dominant narratives serve a purpose. And James Baldwin, in his talk to teachers from the 1960s, where he's talking to New York City public school teachers, reminds us that much of what passes for historical curriculum and education is actually not history, but mythology. That the stories that we tell through history class are not, in fact, an accurate reflection of the, historic, the historical record. They are a reflection of a myth that we want to tell 
about who we are as a nation. Why? Because that myth helps us forget the actual facts of history and thus forget how we've come to be where we are and accept our current situation as inevitable. And our current situation, if we're being blunt, is one in which our nation has been built on a foundation of white supremacy. That is in the historical record, right? We can look at a history of slavery. We can look at individual writings as we will um, from different thinkers and architects in education who, alongside of really beautiful ideas about democratic education, also issued really repulsive uh, statements and ideas and actions about inequality between um, enslaved Africans in the, in the U.S. and colonists, between immigrants in the U.S. and those who were born here, between Mexican Americans in the U.S., um, who particularly in the Southwest where they didn't move, they didn't immigrate, they were, uh, they lost a war and opted to stay in the United States, right? We can look at all of these different groups and the writings of some of our, in many ways, our most poetic um, thinkers about education who exist in a both and space of declaring a democratic power for education, but only including, including a very small group of people, um, as we'll read when we get to Thomas Jefferson in our first unit, um, a small group of people were included in that, de that democratic ideal. So dominant narratives, whether intentional or not, uh, often have the purpose of upholding our social structures. And in the case of schooling today in the United States, we can say that it is, whether we want it to be or not, it is an oppressive system. It is an oppressive social structure for many. Um, and so dominant narratives are stories that, may, that uh, serve to maintain that system, that do not call it into question. Now, there are branches of history that their entire work is to call into question these dominant narratives. James Lowen, um, trained as a sociologist, actually, but engages in historical analysis, uh, is often held up as the exemplar of revisionist history. Now, revisionist history can is a phrase that can be used pejoratively, right? You will hear people say, I don't want to include any revisionist history um, because revisionist history uh, is not accurate. Right, revisionist history challenges those dominant narratives, and the dominant narratives are what we agree to. So, it's revisionist history can be used pejoratively, or not. So, the article by Katz that you'll read in this unit is is directly addressing this idea of revisionist history, and he's saying that there are different camps within it, but that any we often ultimately are grouping anyone who questions dominant narratives into this camp of revisionist history. We can think of then specifically within revisionist history, we can think of specifically the idea of counter narratives. And counter narratives are those that challenge the dominant narrative that say, wait a minute, I have a different analysis, lived experience, um, historical record than you do. And I have a different story to tell, a different narrative to tell about this moment, place, time. Now, the idea of counter narratives is associated with critical race theory, which you've heard a lot about lately in the news if you've been following some of the hubbub over um, anti-racist teaching in K-12 schools. Counter narratives and critical race theory, which is a body of scholarship that comes out of legal scholarship, but counter narratives are put forth as a tool for counteracting oppressive systems because they speak another truth into being, right? They are resistance to dominant narratives, which in law uh, often result in uh, oppressive and racist policies uh, as per Ibram Kendi's definition, right? So counter narratives often are narratives from the margins, um, they are narratives from the periphery, as the, the Ignatian philosopher Enrique Dussel would describe people of the periphery. Um, in liberation theology, we talk about the epistemic privilege of the poor, listening to the poor because they speak with a special power. And in critical race theory, we talk about counter narratives and listening to people who speak from the margins because they speak with a particular power, 
right, to question those dominant narratives. And a lot of what we're going to be doing this semester is putting dominant narratives and counter narratives into conversation with one another. That is a fraught activity, as these pictures remind us, um, again, as the fear over critical race theory and these questions about why are we engaging in work that questions dominant narratives. So the argument against um, anti-racist teaching in schools, uh, the argument against teaching historical counter narratives in schools, um, is that teaching those counter narratives makes white students feel bad about themselves. So as you can see, the kid's holding up a sign that says, I am not an oppressor, right? The argument is that young white children are learning that they are oppressors when they are not in fact, and they are learning um, to feel bad about themselves because they're being introduced to history um, that looks negatively on their ancestors. And that by teaching that racism exists and has existed historically, we are somehow teaching racism right um that we are somehow reinforcing racism right and that comes very much from a colorblind ideology that if we don't acknowledge uh race and we don't acknowledge racism then somehow it goes away that always reminds me very much of midwestern nice right like if we don't acknowledge problems we can pretend they don't exist they do still exist we're just not acknowledging them the sign at the top of course the equality of opportunity over equity of outcomes is a direct challenge to Ibram Kendi's definition of racism. Um, and so these are all these are all fraught and contested terms, but they are, these are some of the terms that we're going to be working with this semester. And so the last term that I want to leave you with, which you may be familiar with, is the notion of hegemony. Hegemony um, is often most associated with the writings of critical theorist Antonio Gramsci. Um, he was an Italian, he was imprisoned uh, in Italy uh, in the early 20th century during the wars, um, I believe for being a communist. But uh, Antonio Gramsci, and he's not the only one who talks about hegemony, but he is most fam famously associated with it in critical theory. Antonio Gramsci reminds us that hegemony is the way that force that oppressive structures are maintained without force. Hegemony, again, for those of you that have taken Dr. Bird's sociology class, if we think about habitus, um, ha habitus is a way that hegemony is reinforced. Hegemony, again, is a tool. It's a tool of oppression. It's a tool that's used to coerce power through narratives, through ways of being, through ideologies. It's a way of maintaining unequal power structures without resorting to force. So James Baldwin's idea about history as myth-making, James Baldwin is talking about hegemony and how K-12 historical curricula are tools of hegemony. Okay, all of this is important for the work that we're gonna be doing this semester because what we're gonna be thinking about is how have we come to have the schools that we have today in the United States? What are the stories that we tell and that we're familiar with about how we've come to be where we are? And what are the stories that we don't often tell? What are the stories that challenge those dominant narratives? And the piece by Cass, I'm not gonna go into detail about it. I'm gonna let you read that and engage in the discussion with your peers, but the piece by Cass is our first example of this. So this is a piece from the 1970s, and you'll see in the optional reading guide questions that I ask you to think about um, a historiography of Katz's historiography, right? Why, what in 1976 would provoke his rethinking of a history of education? And what he's rethinking is precisely this, that we have long told the story of schooling in the United States as an inevitable story or a story of the inevitability of realizing greater democracy and justice for all. That we rely on the democratic theory of thinkers like Thomas Jefferson, who wrote beautifully um, and powerfully about the role of education in maintaining democracy, in empowering us to self-govern. Um, that we often tell the story of U.S. schooling as an inevitable outgrowth of those beliefs around democracy. Katz 
by paying attention just to really the 19th century and when schooling exploded in the United States, systems of schooling exploded, Katz asks us to rethink that assumption. And he says that in fact, schools reflect, legitimize, and sustain the social order at that time, and that they continue to do so. Democracy is part of that social order. It's not gone. Thomas Jefferson's ideas are not gone, but they coexist with systems um, that oppress particular groups of people, people of color, at the time that schooling began, women as well, right? Today we can look at queer students, um, uh, neurologically diverse students, English language learners, immigrants. We can look at all sorts of students who are not based on outcomes, are not um, experiencing an equitable or a just education. And that exists alongside democratic theory and democratic possibility. So I have two contrasting pictures here to leave you with, which we'll be digging into in weeks to come on the left. Um, is a picture of a young native student. I don't know any details about this particular student before he went to an Indian boarding school and once he was there. We'll be learning about Indian boarding schools a bit in unit two, and you'll have an opportunity to learn more about them in our book review project. On the right, we just have students from a 19th century public school classroom. I believe this is from New York City, the very time period that Katz is writing about. So we're gonna be interrogating some of the stories that we tell about school in the United States, and we're gonna think through dominant and counter narratives in order to counteract Genesis amnesia. Very clear about that. How have we come to be where we are? That is the question that we're answering over the course of this class, because knowing that helps you in your practice and in your own work uh, to realize an education that be, may be more in line with your own personal beliefs, um, commitments, uh, along with the ideals that we share or the ideals that we espouse, I should say, as a nation.